tonight. The first shipment through a maritime corridor. Aid arrives on the shores of the Gaza Strip. Desperately needed humanitarian supplies. The situation, in a word, is catastrophic. As ceasefire talks are set to resume. <laughs> Revealing a hidden family history. You're kind of gobsmacked, stunned for a little while. The surprising discoveries made through at-home DNA testing. Plus, a prized possession found in a donation bin. They're like, hold on, is that real? A celebrity signature and a sweet sound. CTV National News with Heather Butts. Good evening. We begin with the rush to get aid into Gaza by air and by sea. The first maritime shipment now unloaded along the shore of the enclave, where the U.N. says a quarter of the population is starving. It comes as those stalled ceasefire talks are set to resume as early as Sunday. CTV's Jeremy Charon starts us off. The first shipment of maritime aid cargo unloaded onto the shores of Gaza. 200 tons of food and supplies destined for Palestinians, but some humanitarian organizations say... This really is not the answer, nor will it be enough. More aid was also airdropped today. German air forces helped deliver several tons of food for the first time. As aid organization World Central Kitchen says, another ship is being loaded in Cyprus. We are loading a new boat ready to deliver more aid. Inside those pilots we have beans, canned meat, canned meat, we have flour, rice and of course we have dates. What isn't clear is how the delivery of aid from ships will unfold. UN relief agencies have flagged huge obstacles in getting supplies to those in need. The situation, in a word, is catastrophic. Um, it, it continues to deteriorate by the day. We are now in a situation where uh, people in Gaza have been going for five months without the basics of life. An airstrike today in central Gaza near a refugee camp is said to have killed dozens, according to Palestinian health officials. The ongoing attacks come as ceasefire talks are expected to resume in Qatar Sunday. I think it is significant because for, for days and weeks now, both sides have actually just stepped away from the table and all they wanted to do was fight. While in Tel Aviv tonight, thousands gathered calling for more to be done to release the hostages still held by Hamas in Gaza. <laughs> Behind every abductee that are still suffering in Hamas's captivity, there are their loved ones who don't sleep, don't eat, cannot breathe for 162 days now, this woman says. Earlier this week, Israel rejected a deal by Hamas, calling it ridiculous and absurd. But word tonight a new deal has been proposed for a three-stage plan that would end the fighting. Heather? Jeremy, thank you. On the eve of St. Patrick's Day, members of Toronto's Irish community stood with pro-Palestinian protesters, demanding an end to the conflict. It's an absolute disgrace what's taken place. Hundreds carrying flags and signs gathered outside Union Station. It follows a similar protest last night outside a Liberal Party fundraiser attended by the Prime Minister. Organizers have vowed to continue their demonstrations until the war ends. Now to the civil unrest in Haiti. More help could be on the way for Americans there by way of a charter flight for U.S. citizens. The same cannot be said for the nearly 3,000 Canadians trapped on the island. Many who say if flights out were an option, the journey to the airport would be a considerable risk. CTV's Colton Prale reports. For the nearly 3,000 Canadians in Haiti, there's still no way out. But Americans will soon have an exit. Saturday, the U.S. announcing chartered flights will soon begin landing in cap Etienne, five and a half hours north of the capital, where violence has shut down the airport. But getting there means risking driving down gang-controlled roads. They would probably shoot the bus driver for trying to smuggle you out, and they would either kill you or take you hostage for a huge ransom. So, frankly, it's just not a viable way out um, for most people. It's really, really risky to try that. 
Sheltered near Port-au-Prince, Richard Phillips says even if Canada offered similar flights, he wouldn't risk the travel. Experts say there's a chance Canadians could eventually be included in the flights, which are currently limited to those with an American passport. That's a possibility, and maybe Canada will, will uh, place a call at State Department. If we have a couple of Canadians, would you take them on board of your plane? CTV News reached out today to the federal government inquiring about possible charters, but did not receive a response. In the meantime, for those looking to flee the violence, options are bleak. Right now, it's keep your head down and uh, follow the embassy directions. And while many search for a way out, there's also a desperate need to get humanitarian aid in. Schools and hospitals in the capital are closed, some ransacked by gangs. Three in four children who cannot access to any uh, health care. 60% uh, of the hospital are closed because no fuel, no electricity, no staff, no medical supply. While the amount of aid flowing into the country has been stifled by gang violence and airport shutdowns, the UN says an air bridge could be set up with the neighboring Dominican Republic to create a safer corridor, potentially as early as next week. Heather. Colton Prale in Ottawa. The Kremlin is accusing Ukraine of carrying out what it calls terrorist activities to sabotage its presidential election, claiming a missile struck a voting station in a Russian-controlled part of Ukraine. <laughs> In Russia, two people were killed and three others injured in a missile strike on the border city of Belgorod. It comes on the second day of voting in an election that's almost guaranteed to deliver Vladimir Putin another six years in power. A Calgary neighborhood is reeling from a dramatic 30-hour standoff in which police shot and killed a gunman. Police say he was firing at officers, discharging more than 100 rounds during the ordeal. CTV's Tyler Barrow has the latest. This is the aftermath of the standoff in Pembroke Meadows. Police say the situation escalated around 8.30 on Friday night, forcing them to discharge their weapons and shoot the man. This is an unfortunate outcome, but our top priority was always the safety of the community. Homes in the area had to shelter in place while part of Memorial Drive had to shut down. Those that were in the area on Friday night recall what they heard. Flashing and I saw the armored car and stuff like that. I said it's pretty intense. Banging and, and then the trucks moving in. Police were originally at the home to execute a firearm search warrant on Thursday afternoon. It was just 10 minutes later the person began firing from the home and over the course of 30 hours he would shoot over 100 rounds. The subject's actions will dictate the officer's reactions. And so at the end of the day, they're uh, through negotiations and tactics, they're taking in the information and deciding what's the best next step. You never know who your neighbors are. You see police action here every now and again, right? You know, for domestic, whatever, but nothing on this level, eh? Since a weapon was discharged, Alberta's serious incident response team is investigating the matter. Police were on scene Saturday to check in with residents, offering supports to those who needed it. Tyler Barrow, CTV News, Calgary. Three people are dead following a string of shootings that locked down parts of a Philadelphia township and spanned two U.S. states. The children were present when the shooting happened. Police say the suspect, 26-year-old Andre Gordon Jr., shot his stepmother, 13-year-old sister, and the mother of his children in attacks at two separate homes in Pennsylvania. He then allegedly fled in a hijacked vehicle before barricading himself inside a home in Trenton, New Jersey. He is now in custody. A vacation to Mexico has become travel trouble for dozens of Canadians who say they've been waiting through multiple days of flight cancellations to try to get home. CTV's San Haupt has the story. This was Tully and Jaden Pershaw last week, excited to head out on a March break vacation to Cancun. I can't wait to hang out with my family. They were supposed to come home Thursday. Instead, they've experienced days of cancellations from Flair Airlines. We sit there for an, forever and then they kick us off. 180 people showing up to the Cancun airport daily to go home. We take about an hour to board and then we sit on the plane for another hour and a half, two hours. 
all for them to tell us the navigational system is still not working. I'm supposed to be getting ready to start my roofing season, so like I should be home pulling out trucks and trailers. I'd start Monday. I'd like to see some sort of compensation. We think we deserve something, whether we're probably going to have to fight it, but I think we're all going to fight it. We're supposed to be taking off. Saturday afternoon, another cancellation. It, it's ridiculous. We got a lot of kids on here. A lot. Some of them disabled, some of them, you know, with issues. They lock us in airports, lock us in buses, lock us in planes. They hold our luggage hostage or people can't get their medications. Some travelers now considering paying thousands for last minute trips with competing airlines. A lot of us are going to go spend $10,000 to get home. We have no choice now. Flair Airlines was unavailable for an interview Saturday, but in a statement says maintenance issues are behind the continued delays. The airline has put passengers up in hotels with some food for multiple nights, but a passenger rights advocate says the airline needs to do more. If Flair is not able or not willing to provide transportation on competitors, which is what it was required by law to do, then you as a passenger can buy a ticket and Flair will have to pay for it. According to advocates, the Canadian government has been lax on airlines when it comes to upholding air passenger protection regulations. Flair is uh, skirting its obligations under the law and the government is turning a blind eye to that. Sam Haupt, CTV News. Another shutdown of a specific fishing season has stirred up a tense debate in the Maritimes. At issue is the harvest of baby eels, called elvers. CTV Sarah Plowman now on a move that's raised questions and created conflict. When spring arrives, so do migrating baby eels known as elvers. They're caught in coastal rivers at night and shipped to Asia to be grown for food. But Ottawa called this season off. Of course, my reaction to that decision was one of great disappointment, but it wasn't one of great surprise. It's the third shutdown in five years as the Department of Fisheries and Oceans tries to manage a fishery its minister says has seen violence and significant illegal fishing that's jeopardizing conservation. This is one of those decisions no one wants to make, um, but it's probably the most prudent way to ensure sustainability, safety and security. There's been pushback and criticism for a lack of consultation. Tobik First Nation Chief Ross Purley predicts Indigenous fishers will exercise their treaty right to fish anyway. There are solutions. Shutting the fishery down isn't one of them. In fact, it's probably going to make things worse. It's going to increase the, the activity of the black market, which we, we're all trying to avoid, but we have no choice. Last season ended early after a confrontation involving unauthorized fishers turned violent. And it was very, very scary. There were incidents right in front of our home. Anne Gagnon felt powerless. She says the poaching continued with little to no enforcement. Her MP wants that to change. You show up at the rivers, you arrest them and you seize their trucks. And then you do the same on the next river the next night. Indigenous leaders and licensed fishermen say they've proposed solutions. Instead, they're told, stay off the waters. It's just incompetence or sabotage, and at this point, I can chalk it up to either. The Federal Fisheries Office is working on new regulations and says so far, there have been five arrests. If you're in the water and you're fishing for elver, your possession of elver, if you're selling elver, then you are breaking the law. Ottawa has said this fishery won't reopen until new regulations are in place, something some scientists think is necessary, but many believe the fishing will continue anyway. Elvers can be sold for between $2,500 and $5,000 per kilogram. Sarah Plowman, CTV News, Fredericton. Remarkable video out of Iceland tonight where a volcano has erupted again, setting off an evacuation. The red glow stretches for three kilometers near the town of Grindavik. It's the fourth eruption in the last 100 days. Hundreds of people have been evacuated from a nearby thermal spa. Coming up, the risk reward of ancestry research. For 67 years, I had, I was certain of my father. The test results creating more questions than answers. Plus, celebrating pride through sport. 
Genealogy tests can be a portal into your family's past, but the process does raise ethical questions. With a growing interest comes improvements in DNA testing and a wider database, leading to results which can shed light on secrets some may not want to uncover. CTV's Kamal Karmali now on one story that shows just how jarring it can be. This is Jody Patterson as a toddler with the man she called dad her whole life, only finding out after his death he was not who she thought he was. Then then suddenly you have to go, holy moly, that is not my biological father. I know nothing about literally half my genetics. It was through a quick genealogy test she discovered a first cousin from a completely different family she had no idea she was related to. And then I phoned a relative who knew my, like, who'd been in my mom's life for a long time and confirmed that there had been a an affair. An affair between her mother and a doctor who she worked with at a hospital. She now believes that doctor is her biological father. But he also had a family of his own, married with four children. All of a sudden, Jody went from having no biological siblings to possibly having four half-siblings. They have not really been uh, too happy to see me or meet me or get to know me. Do-it-yourself genealogy has become a multi-billion dollar enterprise, now allowing for more detailed results of your family tree. It's more info over time has been uploaded, and as those pools get bigger, we have more opportunities to find links. And more accurate, too. We're actually looking at how much of a percentage of your DNA is shared. But with it raising ethical concerns about uncovering hidden secrets that maybe should have been kept buried. There are a lot of surprises. These days when you get the test, um, in the instructions it will say that you might find out things that you don't want to have found out. Jody Patterson has no regrets. Like my dad and I were really close and he loved me absolutely unconditionally. Just a warning to be prepared for some hard truths. Kamel Karamali, CTV News, Toronto. You can find more on this story on our website. Our digital team takes a deeper dive into the genealogy process on ctvnews.ca. Still ahead, inclusion on the ice. Why pride is at the center of this national curling championship. A growing movement to help everyone feel included in one of Canada's favorite winter sports is bringing pride to the ice in Newfoundland this weekend. CTV's Garrett Barry has more. With an anthem, True a ceremonial first rock by an Olympic champion, the Canadian Pride Curling Championship has hit the ice. We're able to loudly say back, like, no, we are here. And we are in sport, whether it's this event or any other other sport. Organizers say it's one of a kind, a national curling competition focused on LGBTQ athletes. A lot of us uh, in, in this uh, competition were people who used to do, you know, competitive curling when we were in juniors and that sort of thing. And then, you know, you might have stopped curling, but it, it gives us all a really good chance to, you know, meet friends from across the country and, and, and have a really... Um, fun competitive uh, tournament. And just like the major competitions, you've got to win to get in. Competitors here have all won tournaments at their local LGBTQ curling leagues. There are 15 of them across the country. Our league has been uh, growing the last few years, which is great. We now have 32 uh, teams, which is, I think, fourth largest in the country, which is pretty exciting for a city like Saskatoon. So, yeah, we're really happy. The event has run since 2006, and this is the first time it's been in St. John's. A little added pressure for the home team. To have that home advantage, to have all of, uh, you know, lots of people here kind of cheering us on, um, is very exciting for us, and, and we really hope that we can do them proud and, and, uh, and win this thing. The competition runs until Sunday. Organizers say it will be a party until the final draw. Halifax, the host last year, they threw a great East Coast party, and we're just that much further east, so we have to just throw a slightly bigger party. Gary Perry, CTV News, St. John's. A colorful tradition kicked off Chicago's St. Patrick's Day party a little early. <laughs> 
crowds gathered along the Chicago River as it turned emerald green. The Chicago Plumbers Union has been doing this for decades, now using what's described as an environmentally friendly vegetable-based dye. After the break, the donation discovery making some noise. The guitar that could have a best-selling signature. Finally for us tonight, a donation in Edmonton that could truly be a music lover's jackpot. One of two guitars given to a local charity appears to be signed by some legendary rockers. CTV's Naramisa on giveaways that could become gifts that keep on giving. At the Sherrod Park Goodwill, you never know what gems you'll find. Among the racks of clothes, books, and household goods is one item making some noise. Then all of a sudden I get a call and they're like, yeah, we think we have something very special that got donated and we usually don't get items like this donated too often. These two guitars were anonymously yeah, dropped sorry. off among piles of other donations. It was the black guitar that piqued the staff's interest. Looked in the case, looked at the autographs and they were actually a little blown away. They're like, hold on, is that real? A cause for excitement because they believe the autographs belong to one of the biggest bands in the world. Welcome to the jungle. We got fun and games. Guns N' Roses, a band that's been around for nearly four decades and sold tens of millions of albums. Lead singer Axl Rose and guitarist Slash are two of the biggest names in rock music. Axel and Slash, I mean, just iconic, iconic in the music industry, um, and they were pretty identifiable, or identifiable. And we matched them up to signatures that we've seen, and they're, like I said, they're close, um, but we, of course, don't have that full authenticity of it. So, of course, with anything that is autographed, the big question is, are the autographs real? And for that, well, we go to an antiques dealer to get the answer. We headed over to Beck Antiques and Jewelry in Sherrod Park Mall. Owner Clinton Beck has spent three decades as a treasure hunter and appraiser. Well, this is certainly a beautiful guitar, isn't it? He believes it belonged to a fan who would have gone to different autograph sessions. Beck broke down the process of authentication. He usually signs it, Axel and then Rose. He usually does both. This is a bit unusual to just have the single signature, but again, it is sort of typical if he, was, if he had 100 signatures lined up, he's trying to get it done as fast as possible. Slash has a very unique si signature as well, and that is perfect as well. After a few more observations. Unfortunately, we don't know where this guitar came from because he was donated to Goodwill. So we don't have real provenance on the piece, but we can see um, by all these things, my gut feeling is that these are the real deal. Beck says the guitar could be sold at auction for $1,250 and thousands more at a charity auction. What blows me away is that money could actually go a long way to supporting our mission of helping people with disabilities to find employment. As for when a local GNR fan can get their hands on the guitar. All we need is just a little patience. Goodwill is still figuring out the next steps. Naranisa, CTV News, Edmonton. You never know what you'll find. That's our show for this Saturday night. I'm Heather Butts. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Good night, and I'll see you again tomorrow.